Hi, we're team 7172 Technical Difficulties, uh, friends and family team from Plano, Texas. My name is Akshay. My name is Phoebe. So to start off, um, I'd like to talk about the robot design. And uh, more specifically, I'd like to talk about our extending drivetrain. So um, to start off with, the reason we implemented the extending drivetrain in the first place was it would allow us to reach both cone stacks in the autonomous portion, leading to a potential 1 plus 10. Um, though we never were able to tune the autonomous to get a 1 plus 10, um, we were, there were other benefits to using the extending drivetrain. So one of the main benefits is for def defense. So um, uh, without the extended drivetrain, if a robot were to park themselves in front of us, both of our arms would not be able to go down to intake. Um, and the, one of the ways um, that our extending drivetrain solves this problem is that while we're extended, we're still able to score on most, if not all, of the same poles. But we can also also reach around the um, opponent robot that is blocking us. And um, so the way the so the way it works is that each side of the robot is um, driven by it drives in opposite directions, and it's it's kind of a differential um, in the way that uh, with a normal drivetrain, if you try and send your two sides of your robot into different directions, um, your robot will probably slip, um, your wheels will slip, or your robot will break. But if you were crazy like us and connected the two sides of your robot with Misumi slides, um, your robot would instead extend. Um, and that's kind of how ours works. Um, so one of the mindsets that we used here was um, if you take um, two two motions or two motor direct two motors that are driving the same mechanism or, or in this case it's four motors and it's our drivetrain and you kind of experiment with um, where what you can do with the different ways your motors can turn and using the difference between them um, that's what gets you a differential. Um, for example, if you had two uh, motors on your elevator and you had them run the same direction um, and made it extend or run in opposite directions and have an arm flip, um, have like an arm flip on top of your elevator, um, you would have a differential. And that's exactly what Infinite Turtles, uh, I believe, did in Freight Frenzy with their elevator. So, um, but one of the things that is an issue with differentials is um, simply the programming complexity. Um, and so one of the ways um, you could I can explain that is so for us when we were trying to tune our one plus ten it was the equivalent of trying to make two robots score on the same pole without interference during this during the autonomous portion, um, which is very difficult and you just generally don't see two teams scoring on the same safe pole um, in their own alliance. Um, so if you were wondering about how rigid the Masumi slides and the whole extension of our robot is, um, I'd say there's about an eight millimeter drop when our robot is fully extended, which is uh, five feet. So there's an eight millimeter drop between the middle of the slides and the ends of the robot, um, which as you can see is definitely rigid enough for us to be able to score. Um, so I'd say if you wanted, if you wanted to use uh, extending drivetrain, Masumi slides would be the way to go. So moving on um, is our the next part I wanted to talk about is our arm motion. So um, on each arm we have at the base we have our turret. Uh, the turret is a 19 or 5.2 to 1 Gobilda motor uh, driving a Gobilda worm gearbox. Um, it's the super duty or heavy duty worm gearbox that runs about 28 to 1 ratio I believe the worm gear. Um, and this has been really consistent for us. Um, we never had to iterate it much. Um, uh, just if for anyone who is planning to use this, do be aware that you do need to tune the distance, the center to center distance between your two worm gears. Um, on top of that, we have our first pivot. Our first pivot is um, a go build a 19.2 to one motor going into, 10 to, into a 10 to one industrial CNC worm gear box. Um, and the reason we chose this gearbox is because when you have a four foot long arm or just a really long arm, that's a lot of leverage, which means you get um, 
combined with all the moving parts on the arm, you get a lot of slack in your arm. So we wanted to try and minimize it as much as possible, and especially on the base. Um, to help both the motor lift the arm and to uh, make the slack in the arm a little bit more bearable, um, we used counterspringing. Um, specifically, we, we put um, a 40-pound torsion spring on each side of the arm. Um, and you can kind of see it in the, uh, in the stream of the robot. Um, but as the arm goes down, the spring is engaged more and more, causing the spring to push back against the arm more and more. As the, as the leverage that gravity has on the arm increases, the spring pushes back with a proportional force. Um, one of the issues we had with this first pivot is earlier in the season, we used a Delrin coupler. Um, and as many people know, Del or plastic and against metal in general is not a smart idea. Um, so at one of our competitions, the arms clashed and that stripped. So just a little bit of learning from our part. Um, so moving on, um, this uh, in one of our older iterations of the arms, we had um, a second pivot. Um, and basically, uh, it was rather than a linear extension on each arm, you had a second joint. Um, so as you can kind of see in the video, um, it was another point of motion. And it was driven by two axon servos. Um, and uh, the issue with this was um, when you already have your four foot long arm, um, as I mentioned earlier, the slack adds up. And specifically with this design, since the axon servos were chained to each other, or there was an axle going between them, and then they were chained to the arm again, uh, just the amount of slack that built build up there was just intolerable, um, or just not very good to work with, especially in the autonomous portion, where you want your arm to be really accurate height-wise, height so that you can pick up cones off the cone stack. Um, efficiently and without dropping cones or grabbing them at the wrong point. So, um, which is why we transitioned to a linear arm or an arm with linear extension on it. The way our linear extension works is it's um, two, two Masumi slides, two stage Masumi slides stacked on top of each other. Um, each one is driven by a GoBuilda five turn super speed servo um, along with, um, and then gear rack. Um, and a gear and gear rack. Um, and then because we're able to use the GoBuilda super speed servos with the servo power module, we had enough torque and we were able to extend our arm um, in about 0 0.8 seconds, if not less. Um, then we have our third pivot. Uh, our third pivot is just pretty simple, just our um, just an axon servo, which allows our arm to be level with the ground or slightly angled, um, no matter which cone or which pole we're scoring our cone on. Um, then we have our wrist. This is what allows our arm to flip over. And in, or this is when our arm flips over in the autonomous pure portion. Um, when the wrist flips over, the, it, the guide is engaged. Um, and then we're able to use the guide to score on the pole um, rather than having to, or and we're able to flip over rather than having to turn the arm all the way around. Uh, last but definitely not least, we have our grabber, which is definitely the most iterated part of our robot. Uh, we started with gear um, and a different claw design uh, that was too had too little torque, so we went to a double over the center linkage, which had a lot of torque but not enough range. Which um, for us, when we have one arm waiting at the substation and the other arm, as soon as the other arm lets go of the cone, you want to be able to grab that cone. So we want to be waiting at the substation, but we can't be inside the substation or else our human player can't put a cone um, for the other arm. So we went the we looked at the Looney Claw and we used um, the portion of the claw which uses the double herringbone gear um, and that which reduced the backlash and um, rather than rather than increase increase the torque, it reduced the backlash. Um, which uh, which helped with the issues we had with the first um, geared version. And then we used a overcharged or revamped style claw at the end with four surgical tubings. And um, with all, what all of this allowed us to do is um, with the end grabber, we, will, we were able to grip the cone at any height. Um, we had a wide range in which the cone could be placed. 
and we were able to stay outside the substation um, without having to move any other joints besides the grab. Um, that is all I have for the robot section or the hardware section. Um, again, my name's Hebe, and I will be talking about the programming aspect of the robot. Sorry, my light just cut out for a second. Um, first, we start with the arm code. So to control the two arms on the robots, the, the code takes three parameters, the desired third angle, pivot one angle, and extension length. Using these parameters and an array of constants, such as gear ratio and arm lengths, the code performs inverse kinematic calculation to determine the correct servo and motor position so the arm reaches the position we want. This method also allows us to keep the third pivot at the constant angle relative to the ground so that the cone always stays upright. Because the robot doesn't know where the arms start at the beginning of autonomous and teleop, we use the absolute linear potentiometers on the third and first pivot to know the starting position of the arm. Unfortunately, as shown in the graph, which comes up in a second, yeah, the control and expansion hub doesn't, doesn't, don't, doesn't read potentiometer voltages linearly. To combat this, we use the collaboration, calibration process for the turret and first pivot that, invo that involves sweeping the motor's range and recording the motor encoder's values and the potentiometer voltages at various points to create a lookup table. This lookup table is referenced at the beginning of every program to establish the arm's GWP positions. Since the arm on the robot can reach up to four feet, the possibility for collisions with poles is extremely high. So we use motion profiling to control the arm's movement so that no collisions can occur. First, the, the arm retracts the extension and angles the pit first pivot upward towards the robot. Then the turret turns to its target angle. When turret finishes, the first pivot and the extension move to their targets. At the end of each arm, we have a Husky Lens camera. The Husky Lens is an AI-enabled camera that is capable of tag, object, and color recognition. It features onboard computing and is a lightweight solution to computer vision. We use the Husky Lens to follow the yellow contour of the pole while scoring in Autan and Teleop. As Husky Lens has never been used in an FTC before, we developed a customized one I2C driver that allows the Husky Lens to interface with the Rev control and expansion hubs through the I2C device ports. As part of our teleop optimization, we use automated presets to allow the drivers to quickly score on different poles with the press of a button. In the teleop, we have modes for different locations that we score from on the field. The first is called gold mode, which can be seen here. In case we encounter a robot playing defense that parks in front of us, we also have silver mode, which utilizes the extended drivetrain. Both modes have their own scoring presets. And that will be the end for programming. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions in chat that have come through on here. The first one's going to be from uh, Screen404. Thanks a lot for all the great questions, everybody. Uh, Screen404 asking, uh, was having two arms difficult to control and coordinate during the competition? So can you talk to us a little bit more about what it was like in a match to actually try to control uh, the, these crazy arms that you have on your robot? Do you want to go first, or? Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, Hebe, you can talk about the software side of this. But um, so from a driver perspective, um, I, there's on the gamepad they have the they have their presets for low, mid, and high on um, the uh, A X and Y buttons. Maybe not those exact ones, but for example, um, and then using various shift buttons, you can change it to high one, high two, mid one, mid two. And basically with a combination of these six buttons and the software presets, they're able to move the arm to wherever in the field. And each arm um, is controlled by one driver. Um, and then the arms also have software limitations um, and automations. So go ahead, Hebe. Um, so for the arm code, we have li we have limitations for the arms. So to avoid the two drivers clashing together during matches, and we we also have limitations. So usually, they, they only one arm is allowed to pick up a cone or anything unless it's in the end during the end game when the driver and the team shipping like the cone and the team shipping elements are both being picked up, which avoids us getting penalties since what if one is picking up the other one cannot pick up a cone. 
and that's pretty much the hardest coordination aspect of the two arms. Yeah, last question we're going to take uh, for 7172, everybody. It's going to be from John Cannon uh, asking about uh, what would you have done if someone else damaged the weaker link between your two halves? So if you had taken damage while your robot was extended out, how would that actually impact your robot in a match? So um, this never happened, so this is probably a purely hypothetical answer. Um, uh, so I assume this is sometime be before Endgame. So I guess the drivers would have to keep the drivetrain extended. Um, and although this would make um, moving across the field difficult, which would mean we wouldn't be able, probably wouldn't be able to park um, as easily in endgame, we would still be able to score from that one spot, or, or what we call our gold position, um, where we just stay in the one spot and score. Um, if, if it were damaged to the point where we could retract but not extend again, um, I wouldn't think it would be too much of an issue because um, I guess realistically um, we've used the extension mainly to just get cones uh, out of our robot that have fallen in um, to avoid incurring penalties. Oh, thank you so much to 7172 Technical Difficulties, one of the coolest robots I think I have ever seen uh, in my entire uh, first history. Uh, so thank you very much. Good luck uh, in the center safe, season, center safe season coming up in a little bit. And if you're watching live, we have one more team uh, coming up, 16458. Techno Wizards will be up in just a few minutes. Thanks a lot, Technical Difficulties. Thank you for hosting. This video on first updates now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in first scholarship. Scholarship applications will open in September. Get ready to go pro and get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.